Hey, as we get started, I need to just take a moment to shamelessly uh, plug two books that I wrote. Um, this message will raise questions for you, but the first one is it's on Genesis 1 called The History of Time and the Genesis of You. It's about the, there's Doug. Hi, Doug. <laughs> so great to see you. But it's about the big idea that we're really living in the sixth day of creation and a, and a seventh is, is coming. The second book is about Genesis 2 called God and His Body. For a while we titled it God and His Sexy Body. But it's about the idea that we really are God's body. Um, his body and His bride. The third book that I think I'm supposed to write before I die is called The Tree in the Middle of the Garden. And we're kind of talking about that all the time, about how this happens. Um, and so if this message raises questions, I hope you, I hope you read these, because I feel like there's just something incredible, several things that the church has missed. And if we understood them, well, we'd understand uh, the heart of God, and, and maybe even one of my sermons. So let's, uh, <laughs> let's, let's start. Last week, uh, We've been preaching, you know, through Romans, and last week we preached a sermon titled Happy Slaves and Miserable Despots, and in that sermon we talked about Vladimir Putin and Ruby Bridges and each one of us, and we read Romans 6, 15 through 23, and noted that Paul seems to be quite clear in, in saying that, well, we're either slaves or, on the other hand, we're slaves. Slaves of the sin and the devil, or slaves of the righteousness, which happens to be this man hanging on a tree. If you're a Christian, this is your master. This is the presence of your father. This is actually the heart of your father, hanging on a tree. So children of God, when you look to the tree, you need to see your Father. And Bride of Christ, when you look to the tree, you need to see something else. He's your, your master, but he's a particular type of master. Because of the limitations of your flesh, you are most likely unaware of what it is that he wants and how incredibly good he actually is. And so he does terrify you, but he will thrill you, and he will set you free. Romans 6, verse 15. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourself to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? But thanks be to God that you were once slaves of the sin, but were obedient from the heart to the tupas, the imprint of teaching to which you were handed over, committed, or even betrayed. And having been set free from the sin, have become slaves of the righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations, literally the weakness of your flesh. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to the impurity and to the lawlessness under lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to the righteousness unto sanctification, which means holiness. Paul says that he's talking this way because of the weakness or the limitations of our flesh. And hopefully remember that he's been talking about Adam, which means humanity. On the sixth day of creation, God breathed his breath, his spirit, into some clay, and Adam became a living nephesh in Hebrew, a psyche in Greek, or a soul in English. And yet there was something not good about that Adam. <laughs> There's something not good with Adam even before the fall. He was in the presence of God, his azer, which is usually translated helper. It's a word that appears 19 more times in the Old Testament. Six, 16 of those times reveal that God is our helper. The other three reveal that no one else is. So Adam was in the presence of God his helper, but Adam couldn't seem to find his helper. 
So God said, it's not good that the Adam is alone, alone in the presence of love. Adam was an I, we've been talking about this, trapped in his me, even before he ever committed a sin. Romans 5.13, Paul wrote this, remember? Sin indeed was in the world before law. Not the law, in, in the Greek it's just law. Paul isn't talking about a particular law, but all law. And, and what is law? Well, it's any knowledge of good and evil to which you are forcing yourself to comply. So it's what you should do, but you do not naturally do. It reveals an absence in you that kind of is you, what Paul is I think referring to as the tupas. It's the imprint of righteousness, but the absence of righteousness. You know, an empty womb is kind of like the imprint of a baby, but the absence of that baby. Well, anytime you should on yourself or you should on your neighbor, say should, 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 you're testifying to the fact that you have taken knowledge of good and evil. Knowledge of good and evil isn't bad. It's actually good, but how you get it can be very evil. In Scripture, you can take knowledge in such a way that everything dies, or you can receive it in such a way that you are filled with life and even give birth to life. You can know because you are known. So anyway, God says it's not good that the Adam is alone. Not good is bad, but Adam doesn't know it's bad and that the word of God is good. So in Romans 5.13, Paul wrote, sin indeed, was indeed, sin indeed was in the world before law was given, but sin is not counted, it's not recognized, it's not considered where there is no law. Things are not good, but Adam doesn't know it's not good. For Adam has no knowledge of good and evil. But now your eyes glass over because you think I'm talking about some mythical mud man in Paul's imagination. But in fact, we're talking about you and every ignorant baby born into this painful world because we're all born without faith in love. And love is the good. And until you know the good, you haven't really even begun to live. Right before he hangs on the tree in his high priestly prayer, Jesus prays this. Listen closely. This is eternal life, that they know you. The only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So eternal life, real life is knowing God who is the good and the word of God who is Jesus, that knowledge is life. <laughs> but getting it could be death. Well, right now, none of us are really living, because <laughs> if you haven't noticed, we're all actually dying. And we all seem to be having just a hell of a time finding our helper. And yet in him we live and move and have our being, according to Paul. So our helper is all around us. He's literally all around us, and yet we don't perceive him. In other words, we're Adam, and this is the sixth day of creation. And sin was in us before we could even comprehend the word should. Each one of us was alone and didn't even know it, and yet now we are coming to know it, aren't we? Aren't you coming to know that? You see, that's the problem with our flesh, the flesh. As we've noted, it only feels its own pleasure and its own pain. As we said, my, my body, for instance, is like the kingdom of my own consciousness. With my mind, it's magical, I move 208 pounds or so of matter that I call my, my body, that I call me, and, and my me is, is threatened by the, I don't know what, 150, 200, 250 pounds of matter moved by your mind that I call you. We're two separate bodies threatened by each other's mere existence, in other words. 
The law tells me that I should love you as I love myself. It's easy to love myself. As Paul writes, every man nourishes and cherishes his own flesh. Why? Well, because every man feels his own pleasure and his own pain in his own flesh. But I don't feel the pleasure and the pain in my neighbor's flesh. I could only feel that if I were to become one flesh with my neighbor, that is one body, one physical body and one psychic body, one, one soul. So the law tells me that I should love and it reveals that I don't love, but it doesn't give me the power to love, it just reveals that I'm alone. Well, in the sixth day of creation, Adam had no faith in love. He did not recognize love, and God is love. Adam is alone in the presence of love and doesn't even know what alone is. It's evil, and what the good is, it's love, and God is love. So God said, it's not good that the Adam, that is humanity, should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. And then God does something absolutely incredible. Something that even now fills you with desperate hopes, the deepest of terrors, and just a world of shame. First, he puts the atom to sleep. He puts humanity into a deep sleep, tardima in Hebrew. And I often wonder if maybe we're still in that deep sleep. Asleep until Christ wakes us saying, you were asleep, honey, <laughs> having a nightmare. You were dreaming that you were dead. Scripture often talks that way. Whatever the case, God puts humanity into a tardima, a deep sleep. And second, he divides the Adam in two, turning Adam into Adam and Eve. And then Adam exclaims, this is my flesh. Then Genesis reads, they will become one flesh. And they were both naked and unashamed but you're all ashamed. I, I noticed that, because you're all wearing clothes. You're ashamed, and it makes things incredibly tough on, on the preacher. Because see, just this topic makes you shut down, doesn't it? Hide yourself in fig leaves and fear. Maybe you're gay. Maybe you're wrestling with your gender and you think that I'm going to condemn you. Maybe you're having an affair, or you're lusting after your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's husband, and, and you're waiting for me to remind you, that's wrong. Maybe you're old and things don't work like they used to work, and you'd rather that I would just ignore this sad and painful topic altogether. Maybe you're single, and you think I'm going to suggest that something's wrong with you. Well, something is wrong with everybody, except maybe Jesus, and he was single. And yet he kind of wasn't single. Whatever the case, I'm asking you to please not shut down, but just consider that all those hopes and fears, joys and sorrows, the sorrows and, and longings, that they, they really aren't about sex or even people. Just consider that maybe they're about God. And you were built this way on purpose. Paul had been married because he was, had been a part of the Sanhedrin. But apparently he was single when he quoted Genesis in his letter to the Ephesians writing this. He quotes Genesis saying, the two shall become one flesh. And then I am saying this refers to Christ and the church. That's us. The bride of, of Christ. You see, when things are working correctly which is usually out of my control, there is this moment in which my flesh becomes one flesh with the flesh of my bride. And my body, my physical body and my psychic body literally feels her pleasure and even experiences her pain as if, as if we were one body. In that moment, I lose my psyche and I find it in her like one psyche, one soul. In that moment, I don't need a law telling me that I should love my wife. I just do, it's like my nature. In that moment, I'm not alone. 
but then I am again. And longing to get that moment back. And according to Paul, even that moment isn't what I am really longing for. It's a sign built into my flesh from before the fall. It's a sign pointing to something or someone, someone both in my wife and enthroned in in heaven. It's a sign pointing me, pointing us toward home. So hang in there. Don't shut down. And pay attention, okay? Adam was alone in the presence of love, and that's not good. So number one, God put Adam to sleep. Number two, God divided Adam in two and said the two shall become one flesh. And number three, he left the Adam. (laughs) That is Adam and Eve. He left the Adam alone, or apparently alone, in a garden with an evil talking snake, and in the middle of the garden, the most mysterious, wonderful, terrifying tree. Two trees in one spot, or one tree with two names, for on that tree hangs what? The life. And on that tree hangs the good in flesh. On that tree hangs our righteousness, our master. On that tree hangs fruit with seed in the fruit. And on that tree hangs our helper, our husband. God left Adam and Eve where we are right now. But have hope, bride of Christ. Scripture makes it clear that this is still the sixth day of creation. And the seventh day is coming. In fact, it's already at hand. And on the seventh day, absolutely everything is good. And it is finished. And God will be all in all, according to Paul. God will be the righteousness, the good, and the life in all. All in all. That's your Bible. Deal with it. Just deal with it. Well, I just had to remind us of that before we read any further in Romans, Okay. Next verse, Romans 6, 20. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to the righteousness. But what fruit did you have then? For the things of which you are now ashamed. For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from the sin and have become slaves of God, you have your fruit unto sanctification and the end, eternal life. For the wages of the sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our our Lord, Kurios, our, our master. We read that last week. And my guess is that when we read the word fruit, most of you heard something like this, good deeds. Or maybe a generous salary, a house, and a car with two car garage, You think of the product of your will and your work like a wage. In Galatians, Paul tells us what he means by fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. That is the good. The next word is faith, even though it sometimes gets translated faithfulness. The word is faith. Faith is a fruit of the Spirit gentleness or meekness and encratia, translated self-control or control of self, that is control of my me. And then he writes, against such things there's no law. Fruit is what everybody wants and nobody seems to possess. By that I mean love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, etc. They're not really like commodities And yet we try to make them commodities, don't we? So sometimes we think of fruit, and we talk this way, as if fruit were money or mammon. But it's not money or mammon. Love, for instance, isn't a commodity. And when we try to make it a commodity, it's often called prostitution or rape. And then we no longer know love. Like it's dead. We killed it. But you can't actually kill it. Anyway, the fruit is not a commodity, and it's not a limited commodity. The more love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, good that you experience is not the less love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and good that your neighbor experiences. The fruit isn't something you can store in a barn to be used later. The fruit is something that can only be known in the now, the the newness of 
the now, so you don't have the fruit so much as the fruit has you. It shows up in strange places, like Ruby Bridges in New Orleans, who we talked about last week, or the Apostle Paul in, in prison, singing hymns to God like he, he did in the Philippian jail. So when people say things like, God, you know, God, God wants me to have peace and joy, and so I'm sure he wants me to get those new seat warmers in my new Mercedes. When they'd say that, that they're not talking about fruit. They're talking about fake fruit. So where does fruit come from? You know, the harder you try to make fruit, the more you'll fake fruit, and the more people will lose faith that there even is such a thing as fruit. They'll think there's only just, you know, religious people pretending to love when they don't love pretending to be joyful when they're just miserable as hell, people utterly impatient with any lack of patience, terribly unkind all in the name of kindness, hating the good in the name of the good, even crucifying the good, talking about the faith of Jesus and teaching faith in Mises, proud of their self-control, which isn't the control of self, but just the opposite, competition, envy, and pride, the work of the flesh. We all seek Knowledge of good and evil so we can make some fruit, but we, all we make is, is fake. You could call it religion. On a whim, I googled fruit of the spirit workbooks. And like over a hundred different titles popped up on my screen with pictures. I looked at all of the pictures, all of the covers of all of the fruit of the spirit workbooks, and not one of them had a picture of just where it is that fruit actually comes from. You can't make fruit. You can only fake fruit and make Pharisees. So when Paul wrote fruit, he thought of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, the good, faith. When he wrote fruit, he thought of that, and he thought of fruit. You know fruit, like figs that grow on trees, grain and grapes which grow in fields and become bread and wine. Now, we modern people think that fruit comes from Safeway in a nice cellophane wrapper. And it doesn't. At least that's not where it starts, if you didn't know. Do you know that with all, all of our science and technology, with all of our knowledge, all of our will, and all of our work, humanity has not manufactured one piece of fruit, one actual piece of fruit. And how you get fruit is entirely counter intuitive. It's in counter You take a seed, which is in a piece of fruit, or actually is the fruit, as in the case of like wheat or barley or something. You take a seed, which carries the future in its bosom, like a whole lot of knowledge in a seed, like the very presence of things hoped for. You take a seed, and you don't put it in a bank, like a treasure, or place it on a shelf, like a book, or even eat it because you can turn a seed into bread. You don't even eat it. You, you put that seed in broken, shitty soil. And I say it that way because if I said manure, you wouldn't know what I was talking about. Then you cover it up, and, and you walk away as if you're walking away from a funeral. <laughs> and then you wait. You wait. You, you can't dig it up. You have to wait. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, you are God's field, writes Paul. So fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faith, and self-control of old me. Fruit is righteousness. That's what Paul calls it in other places, the fruit of righteousness. And, and fruit is fruit, and human fruit is called babies. Blessed be the fruit of your womb, said Elizabeth to Mary, the mother of Jesus. Baby Jesus, babies. And where they come from is like entirely counterintuitive. And how that happens is like, well, it's like the drama of all of Scripture and all of space-time. As most of you know, in Genesis chapter 1, God gives an overview of, of time, all time, from the beginning to the end. From the moment when he speaks his, his word into the, the void on, on day one to the moment it is finished at the end of day six, the edge of day seven, when everything is good, 
Uh, that's Genesis chapter 1. But then in Genesis chapter 2, the Bible clearly starts describing what happens on day 6 when God makes Adam male and female, when God makes Adam in his own image, when God makes um, everything good that's not already good. So from Genesis 2 through the Revelation, the Bible is describing day 6. In other words, it's describing now and how we get to the seventh day, how it is that we become fruitful. Because you see, back in Genesis 1, in its brief summary of all that happens on day 6, because it goes through seven days and it summarizes day 6, in that summary, which is all of human history, God speaks his word as like the commandment to humanity. It hangs over us like a threat, a promise, and a question. Genesis 1.28, God said to Adam, male and female, be fruitful. That speaks to your fears, doesn't it? Will I ever be fruitful? <laughs> Will I ever do something with this life? It inflames our deepest desires. All I really want is to be fruitful. And it raises this question. How can I be fruitful? You know, the Bible is really such an amazing book. And if you read it carefully, you'll discover that it's the record of two simultaneous stories. Number one, religion. What Paul refers to as law. Just law without the article. Law is a reference to any system, method, or practice of human self-improvement. It's religion. Religion is a story of humanity taking knowledge of good and evil in an effort to become the image of God. So, number one, the Bible is a story of religion interspersed throughout with number two. The story of all sorts of strange women trying to have babies. And the two stories are interconnected in fascinating ways because we soon discover that God is Israel's husband. In Hebrew, Baal. Now, that should freak some of you out, but that's what Scripture says. It just gets translated different because the word means master, ruler, or husband. But Israel lusts after other Baals, Baals that she can turn into commodities and uh, use those commodities for her own purposes, commodities called idols. So Baal is also an idol. In Scripture, all the nations worship idols. Why? Because they're trying to be fertile. <laughs> they're trying to obtain love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faith, and self-control. They're trying to grow figs and grow grain and grapes. They're trying to have babies, you know, life that lives on after you die. Everyone is religious because we're all trying to bear the fruit of life. And each of us is an idolater because we don't know how it's done. Idolatry is ultimately using God and worshiping yourself. But that will not get you pregnant, bride of Christ. Next verse. Or do you not know, brothers, for I'm speaking to those who know law, that the law, I guess the law of marriage, the law lords over, kureu, we're talking about masters here, the law lords over ha anthropu, the man, only as long as he lives. Now remember, the man is also the Adam, which is all of humanity. The Bible talks about all of us as like one man, and the Adam is to be married to God. For a married woman, next verse, is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she's not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, she's talking to men as if they were all one woman, because we are also all one woman. He, he writes, um, you were put to death 
to in or by the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions, pathema, our sufferings, aroused, aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit to uh, or of the death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way, the newness of the Spirit, and on the old way, the oldness of the written code, uh, the letter. Now all of that is incredibly confusing for my tiny brain, but not so much for my heart once I remember a few things. Number one, humanity is standing at the base of this tree, in a garden at the edge of space-time and eternity. Number two, on the tree is the eschatos Adam, which makes all of us something like the eschatos Eve. On the tree is the Christ, and at the base of the tree is his bride. On the tree is fruit with seed in that fruit. And number three, the word of God, will of God, and judgment of God hangs over the whole picture like a threat and a promise and a question. How will you be fruitful? Be fruitful. How will I be fruitful? Well, first, because of the limitations of my flesh, because I only feel my own pleasure, my own pain, because that limitation produces sinful passions in me, I'm tempted to just take the fruit and eat it. He's the beauty, you know, in every sunset. You ever seen a sunset and not said thank you? He's the rhythm in every song, the logic in your cell phone. He's the goodness in the seat warmer in your new Mercedes. He's the life that became the sausage on your pizza. He's our righteousness. That means the thing that makes us right. I'm tempted to simply consume the good and the life as if I were the master of the good and the life. But when I do, everything dies, and that's not good. <laughs> Maybe you've been down that road. And so second... I could analyze the fruit, learn all about the fruit, even dissect the fruit, all in an effort to comprehend the fruit and then make myself the fruit. That's called science and religion. And both of them are just wonderful for learning about things and making technology, but basically worthless for knowing persons and producing fruit. Jesus said to the Jews in John 5, listen closely, you search the writings the scriptures, because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. You see, he is eternal life. It's they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. The religious Jews, the scribes and the Pharisees, were jealous of Jesus, and so wanted to be Jesus, but would not surrender to Jesus, so they took the life of Jesus on a tree in the garden. They even did it in strict accordance with what they considered to be the letter of the law. It's actually just what Adam and Eve did when they were jealous of God and so took knowledge of God to make themselves like God, but they didn't make themselves good like God, just evil, dead, and dying. It's what we all do every time that we sin and every time we try to justify our sins, which is the very most deceptive of all sins, human religion. We take knowledge of the good so we can make ourselves good, but we just make ourselves worse. <laughs> Romans 7, verse 4a. In fact, maybe you could put that scripture back up for a minute, Sasha. The last one, the Bible text, and then you can go back to the picture. Well, actually, go back to the picture when I tell you, okay? But this is what Paul wrote. You were put to death to, in, or by the law, through the body of Christ. You see, when we see Jesus as a law, as a thing, as knowledge of good and evil that we can use to justify ourselves, we break his body and shed his blood. We kill him, who is the life. And when we put him to death, we put ourselves to death, for he is our life. 
So Jesus died and you died so that, verse 4b, you might belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, that you might bear fruit for God. Now you can put the other picture back up if you want, Sasha, but who is that other? Well, it's, it, it's not a dead Jesus. I'm not so sure that there actually is a dead Jesus. The book of Hebrews says that he has an indestructible life. So there was a dead body of Jesus, but he delivered up his spirit, and Paul writes that the spirit is life. Whatever the case, you're no longer married to the law. That's like a dead Jesus. Uh, that's like an idol of your own creation. That's religion. All of Israel's supposed obedience to the law, all of her religion only led her to crucify the substance of the law, her Lord, her husband, our helper. You're no longer married to religion. You're married to our living Lord, your helper. That's Jesus. And so back to that question, how will we be fruitful? Bride of Christ. Put it another way. How can we be righteous when we're so wrong? Put it another way. How does the old Adam, remember? We talked about this. How does the old Adam become the new Adam? Put it another way. How does Jesus fulfill the law in us? Remember what Adam and Eve did immediately after taking the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Because it's crazy. They each hid that place on their own flesh where two bodies become one body and sometimes produce fruit. Another body called the baby. And this is weird, but when my babies feel pain, I feel pain. When they enjoy Winnie the Pooh, which they don't enjoy anymore, but when they did, I enjoyed Winnie the Pooh. I, I feel their, their, their pain, and I, I feel when, when they're happy. When they're happy, I'm happy. They're like my own flesh, as if my whole family is like one body. Well, both Adam and Eve hid that place in their physical bodies, the place that made them into a family, and they each hid a very similar place in their psychic body. It's a place that they suddenly knew as shame. It's where they knew they should be something and they were not that something. It's where they knew that they should be righteous and they were not righteous. It's where they knew that they should love but they didn't know love. It's where they knew about the good but didn't know the good, their helper. They hid themselves, their sinful selves, their tupas. You know, I think it was Jesus on that tree in the garden because he's the good and he's the life. And you know, I think it was Jesus that went looking for him in the garden because he's what God looks like when God goes walking and looking for the lost. And it seems that Jesus is actually attracted to your two paws. That place you cover In your heart, your shame. So anyway, how do we bear fruit? <laughs> That's the question. Common sense, law, and religion would suggest that, well, you take control, go to church and be on your best behavior, get dressed and cover your shame, get more knowledge because knowledge is power, apply that knowledge to yourself, check it, judge it, make it happen, and get worried if it's messy or it starts to hurt. But how do we actually bear fruit? Well, how do farmers grow fruit? How do brides get pregnant? You see, it's more than a bit counterintuitive. You surrender control. You go on a romantic date and get as vulnerable as you can. You get undressed and expose your shame. You don't need knowledge, you need seed. You receive it in broken soil and you let it die, so to speak. 
And you don't dig it up. You, you try not to worry. In fact, you expect some mess and you know that there will be some pain and some labor. But what is born isn't dead. And it's not fake. It's the life. It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, the good, gentleness, faith, control of self. It's, it's grace. Where? Right where sin had abounded. It's the new man born out of the old man like a baby is born from a womb. You actually are the virgin that conceives and gives birth to Christ. I betrothed you, writes Paul to the Corinthians. I mean, we modern people, we just read this stuff and we go, what's wrong with Paul? But he wrote this. I betrothed you, writes Paul to the Corinthians, to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ who is our righteousness. You're the bride of Christ, and when you surrender to Christ, you also give birth to Christ. You're his mother. It doesn't matter whether or not you're confused about your gender. Uh, whether you're gay or straight, married to one woman for 30 years, or you have a string of broken hearts in your wake. It doesn't matter if you've had five babies and you're proud, or you've aborted five babies and you're utterly ashamed. It doesn't matter if you wanted children and don't have any children, or if you had children and now you don't want them. It doesn't matter if you thought that your business, you know, was this huge success in this world, or whether you feel like you lived your whole life and produced no fruit. It doesn't matter what you feel ashamed of, so long as you surrender that place of shame to Jesus. He is <laughs> attracted to that place in you. And in that place of shame, you'll find a baby. In the place of the angry Pharisee Rabbi Saul, you'll find the Apostle Paul. In the place of Peter the coward, you'll find Peter the rock. In the place of the harlot, you'll find the bride. In the place of Mises, you'll meet Jesus. In the words of Isaiah 54, sing, O barren one who did not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not been in labor, for the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. Verse four, fear not, for you will not be ashamed, for your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. My wife, Susan, desperately wanted to have a baby. And you see, that's the thing about babies. You can't just decide, you think this when you're 15, from all they tell you in health class, but you can't just decide to have a baby any more than you can just decide to make a miracle. Fruit is not a wage like sin. Fruit is a gift of grace like a miracle. So it was agony for Susan, because she desperately wanted a baby and she wasn't getting pregnant. It was agony for Susan, even if it was pretty great for me for a time. But by the end of the year, I was in a bit of agony too, it was agony for Susan, for she thought that she'd done everything right. I mean, dated a guy for five years, waited for the honeymoon, supported her husband through seminary, said all the prayers, gone to all the Bible studies. She even arranged for plenty of romantic dates and wonderful little fig leaves that I had the privilege of removing, and still, no babies. She got angry. We had a friend at the time who broke all the rules cheated on her husband, lied to her friends, and, and she got pregnant. One day coming home from work, Susan just like kinda lost control. She pulled the car over in a rage and she just started yelling at God saying, I did everything right, she did everything wrong, and you gave her a baby? And then through her tears she heard the Lord say, I made that baby. How dare you tell me that I can't give her a baby? My baby. And then Susan broke. 
She began to just sob. She cried, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I forgive, I forgive, I forgive. That means I let, I allow, I surrender. I don't know if that had anything at all to do with the fact that Susan got pregnant a short time later. All sorts of holy women in Scripture can't seem to get pregnant, and we do not know why. I don't know if that event had anything to do with the birth of my son, Jonathan, but the surrender of that place of shame in the soul of my wife had everything to do with the birth of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faith, and self-control in Susan. And you see, now there's a word for all of this, and the word is not work. The word is worship. And so our righteousness, our husband, our helper, who was made fit for us on the sixth day of creation, a a Friday, our Lord took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. And in the same manner, after supper and having given thanks, he took the cup and he said, this is the covenant in my blood. It's a marriage covenant. And then he said, do this in remembrance of me. And he said, drink of it, all of you. All of you. So if you would, just close your eyes for a moment. And I want you to find yourself. You can find yourself because it's where you are. (laughs) And find that part of yourself that maybe you're, ah, you're just you're hiding under fig leaves. The place you, you you feel shame. And it might surprise you, because it's not always it's not always in the place we think. We're really good at deceiving ourselves. But as best you can. And you, you can even ask God to help you point it out. He's done that with me. It's kind of shocked me at times. I want you to find yourself. And now present yourself to the righteousness. Another way to say that is surrender yourself to Jesus. It's actually the righteousness of God in you, like a seed, that causes you to surrender. And that seed, the righteousness of God, is who it is that you actually are. So surrender your self to Jesus.